I don't know whether you're all telling the truth or not. You know why I say that? It's because when I was growing up as a kid, they always used to say this. It was a cliche all the time. Preacher would get up and say, how many would rather be in church today than the best hospital in town? <laughs> well, hello? Anybody want to be in church rather than in the hospital? Hello? But I thought, no, how many would rather be in church than uh, the Super Bowl? Let's put it that way. Good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning on this beautiful September Sunday. Yeah. Amen. And all those that went to the beach today, I just pray that the fleas of Narragansett <laughs> infest their bathing suit. Can you say amen? <laughs> so we're so glad to have you all with us this morning. Those that are watching online today, we're glad to have you with us as well. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord this morning. <clears throat> the title of my message today is There's a Miracle in the Crowd. I want you to know this morning that there is a miracle in this crowd. I mean that. I mean that. Some of you are looking at it from a little bit different perspective because you really don't know how I'm going to come at this this morning. But there is a miracle in the crowd. John chapter 6 verse 1. The Bible says, After this Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill, sat down with his disciples around him, and it was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip. For he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Great story. Hope you all know the story. You all have the background of the story. I have been where they say this miracle took place, and uh, of course it was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and not too far from the city of Jesus, Capernaum, and it's a wonderful part of the world, and I hope someday to be able to go back there again, but there was a miracle that took place today because of somebody that was in the crowd. Everybody needs a miracle. I can say that, and I know for sure this morning. That everybody in this room, you need some kind of a miracle. I know that. Life is a learning experience for all of us, and we, it's a process that never ends. You should continue to learn. Can you say amen? Uh, I had a, a, one of my teachers in Bible college told me, just as I was finishing school, he got up to the class and he said, now you've been through three years of, of college, and you've studied every book of the Bible, you've studied a little bit of Hebrew, a little bit of Greek, you've studied all of the things that are here. He said, now what you need to go and start to learn something. I understood what he mean later on, but God is always teaching us something about ourself. You ever learn things about yourself? I do. My wife helps with that. We're also learning about others. We also learn about life. Life is a real learning experience. And we also are learning more and more about God all the time. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. See that? Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You don't have to be scared of God. God's not a meanie. God's not up in heaven with a whip just waiting to throw people into hell. I, I don't read that in the Word of God. He said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves you today. He is a gentle and lowly of heart. And he said, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, the only way to learn from Jesus is you've got to get yoked up to him. That means you have to get connected to him. In order to get anywhere in the kingdom of God, you have to have the right connections. I don't live my life in fear. I don't live my life fearing uh, uh, the enemy. I don't fear demons and I don't fear uh, uh, oppressive spirits. I don't fear that. I don't. The reason being is because 
I'm a child of God. We sing it. Do you believe it? We sing that song, I am a child of God. So when I walk around, I know the enemy looks at me and says, that man's a problem. That man is going to bring me some difficulty, some heartache. I know that. So I'm not running around in fear of him. He's afraid of the child of God. If you knew who you were, what you could do for God. So any, to get anywhere in the kingdom, you've got to have connections, and it takes faith. I like what one man said. One man said, God put giants, and I'm quoting, God put giants in the promised land to keep unbelievers out. Remember, they said, there's giants there. We seem like grasshoppers. They didn't want to go in. So how many need a miracle this morning? Maybe you need a miracle in your physical body. Maybe you need a miracle in your finances. Maybe you need a spiritual miracle in your life. Maybe in your home you need some kind of a miracle. Well, I don't believe that God wants anything but the best for his children. I mean that. I love my children. I love them dearly. I have a son and a daughter. And I love my, my granddaughters. And you know what I've noticed about that? Uh, a lot of things, I, I think when you're younger and you have your children, you're so busy and you're doing your thing, you don't take enough time just to enjoy them. So I decided when my first granddaughter was born four years ago, a little over four years ago, I said, I'm going to slow down here. And I'm going to enjoy this. And I love them dearly. And you know, they can't do really anything that turns me off or upsets me. Really, they, they can't. I know I, I do spoil them, but I, I have the right to do that. Their parents shouldn't do that. But I can, I do. But I notice that Gia will pick her nose. And then she always comes over and she goes, Rome, she wipes it on my pants. That's gross to you, but it's not gross to me. I'm just being honest with you. John, you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're facing this. And sometimes they'll, they'll, when they were little, they would spit up. They'd spit up all over me. And I like what Levi said one time, his daughter threw up on him and he didn't push her away, he pulled her close. See, that, that's a difference. I believe that God wants nothing but the best for his children because he loves us. 3 John, verse 2 says, Beloved, get this, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's what God wants for you. Look at that scripture. That you prosper in all things, be in health, just as your soul prospers. Jesus went up into the mountainside, and all this throng, thousands of people came up there. What did he do? He fed them spiritually. He taught them. Why in the world did Jesus think that he had to feed them carnally by giving them food? Why did he feel that? Because God's concerned about every area of our life. He knew that these people were hungry. And yes, he just wasn't so super spiritual and heavenly minded that he was no earthly good. He realized they have a carnal need here. These people are hungry. And God has the ability to take care of every need in your life. We're limited, but God's not. Amen. So when I say that God has the ability to take care of every need in your life, he can and he knows about every need that's in this room this morning. We can't keep track of everything that's happening, but God can. Because he's a great God. Read your little something to think about in your bulletin today. Not right now. All right. God is so great that he knows even the smallest detail in our life. Luke 12 and 7. God knows how many hairs you have on your head. <laughs> Somebody just said, not many. <laughs> God knows them. If you only got two, he knows you got two. I was in this week uh, on Friday. I went up to Boston to visit a gentleman that comes to church here once in a while. And he's going through chemo the the chemotherapy treatment right now. He has cancer. And uh, he and I were talking about it. And he's lost a lot of his hair. And I use that as an opportunity to tell him, that God cares and God knows exactly what's going on. I said, you realize that God has every hair of your head numbered? Even though that you've lost hair, he still knows what you got because he's God. All-powerful. Hebrews 4.13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. 
And he is the one to whom we are accountable. He knows everything. I'm a child of God. You're a child of God this morning. He's concerned about every area of your life. I have found that faith doesn't necessarily know where it's going, but it does know who's leading. There's been so many times in my life I didn't have a clue what God was doing. I said, God, I don't know what you're doing here, but I know you're doing something. And my faith is in Him. A miracle working God is in this room today. He's here. And God cares about His children. Children are small, and sometimes other people look at them as insignificant. I remember I was, my wife and I were talking about this yesterday. Little kids are very innocent, and, and uh, we were out at Dairy Queen with the girls last night, and uh, Gia was, or not Gia, but Zoe, which is, she's two, she was saying hi to people. And I, I remember, I said to my wife, remember when Gia was that age, and you, we'd walk through the mall, and everybody, hi, 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 everybody. And a lot of people go, oh, hi, how are you, dear? But some people would just go, I just wanted to go over and say, hello, that child just said hello to you, you know? Of course. Once people brought their children to Jesus, and the disciples had this attitude, ah, don't bring children around, we don't want children around. Notice what happens, Mark chapter 10, verse 14. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. God cares about little things. You may think, I'm so insignificant. I'm nothing. I'm a sinner. If you only knew, pastor, what I've done in my life, I don't know. I don't have to know. God knows everything, but he still cares about your life. God desires nothing but the best for his children. Everyone needs a miracle, and today there is a miracle in the crowd. Going through some tests? Good. Your test means God has a plan. A plan. You're not alone, just going through life, just winging it if you're a child of God. You say, well, I, you don't know what I'm going through, Pastor. I know I don't, but God, if you're having a test, means he's got a plan for you. Yeah. Your test will lead you to your miracle. Back in John 6, Jesus said to Philip, we'll read again, John 6 and 5. Jesus so soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Notice what it says in verse 6. He was testing Philip. For he already knew what he was going to do. It was just a test. God already had the plan. So you may be going through a test this morning, but God got the plan. You say, where will I ever get the money? What am I going to do with my children? What am I going to do in my marriage? What kind of treatment am I going to be able to take? What am I going to do with my life? We may have questions, but God already knows the solution already knows we're like philip john 6 and 7 philip replied even if we worked for months we wouldn't have enough money to feed them philip's mind turned to the carnal first and foremost how can we how can we feed them he wasn't looking for the miracle in the crowd all philip was saying how can we do this and you know what we all want to be self-sufficient Men, we're worse at this than our wives are. Women will ask for directions. They'll ask for help. Men won't. They'll drive 50 miles out of the way and still never ask for directions. Well, dear, don't you think we should stop and ask them? Oh, no, it's, I know it's just up the road here. I know it's just up the road. And after they run out of gas and they say, okay, maybe we should GPS this and see what's going on or stop and ask somebody. And, and we want to, we want to say, you know, I got this. I know all about this. Jesus said to the Laodicean church these words in Revelation 3, 17. Because you say I'm rich, I become wealthy, and need nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We need God. I am nothing on my own. I can do nothing on my own. I have to have God. And God usually uses something or someone to bring about the miracle, and it's usually different than what we think it, it's going to be. Moses and the children of Israel wanted water, and God brought water out of a rock. Ravens brought lunch 
to Elijah. God enlisted a little boy to go out and fight the ultimate warrior, Goliath, this giant of a man was fought by a little boy. God chartered a whale to take Jonah to his next revival in Nineveh. Jesus turned plain water into wine. God usually always uses something. There's a miracle in the crowd this morning. God wants to use somebody in this crowd this morning. God wants to use something or someone to bring about that miracle to fruition. The only thing God may need in this crowd this morning is obedience. Or faith, a little faith. See, God uses the little to perform the great. Let's go back to John and all these people that are on this side of the hill with Jesus. In verse 9, Peter's brother said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish but what good is that with this huge crowd just a boy's lunch jesus said tell everybody to sit down i like that they're all what are we gonna do oh we got five there's this kid here and he's got five loaves and two fish jesus said tell him to sit down so they all sat down on the grassy slopes the men alone numbered about 5,000. There was over 5,000 people in that crowd. And then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. I think it's always good to give thanks to God for what he's blessed you with. I don't just give thanks for my food. We always do that. Just thank God for the food, ask him to bless it. I give thanks for what I have. I give thanks to God for my old truck. I really do. Dan Bullock can't run my truck. He doesn't know how because it's, you have to know your stuff to run my truck. You really do. <laughs> my mother can't run my truck because it's one of those type of trucks. Okay, it's got a lot of little issues and you've got to baby it. But anyhow, I give thanks for it. Sometimes I'll pet the arm, the arm rest, and I'll say, God, thank you for this, this truck. It's a blessing to me, and it is. I think it's important to give thanks. And then they distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. Can you say hallelujah? I like that. As much as they wanted. PT Treasures, we all went to uh, Wright's Chicken Farm yesterday. But I didn't get to eat as much as I wanted. I've been on a, a, a diet that my wife has had me on. And you, you eat everything you don't like diet is what it is. <laughs> Literally. And... Uh, so I, I have to eat wheat bread now. I have to eat uh, no pasta, uh, no red meat, no fried foods. I know it sucks. It's terrible. It's awful. I hate it. <laughs> but I've been doing it for about a month. And uh, I, to be honest with you, I feel rotten. <laughs> I do. I, I told my wife, I said this way. I said, I feel, I feel rotten. I've been eating so healthy. I mean, it's just unreal. This healthy stuff. They drink water, fruit, vegetables. Uh, you know, I don't even eat potatoes anymore, you know. So anyhow, it's been like a little over a month doing that. And I told her I feel rotten, but I said, I'm going to take a little Sabbath day rest when we go away to PT Treasures, and I'm going to eat the chicken and homemade French fries and the pasta. And I didn't drink soda, I just drank water. And, and uh, so I'm sitting there, and I had chicken, and, and then I want, I want another piece of chicken. You know how they do it there. It's just like a gorge. And so I, I, I got another piece of chicken. My wife said, okay, that's it. That's it. That's not even scriptural. It says, and they all ate as much as they wanted. There's Molly back. Let's move on. And after everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers. I like that. God doesn't waste things. So that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. The same God who fed over 5,000 people with five fish and two loaves of bread is here today. Amen. Here today. Your test means God has a plan. And today there is a miracle in this crowd. Two things to note about this miracle. You need to be available. You need to be available. I said there's a miracle in this crowd. I'm talking about you. You need to be available. The little boy was there when Jesus needed him. 
How many times have we needed God and God not been there? Never for me. Never. How many times has God needed us and we've not been there for God? Time and time again. But the little boy was there to give God something to work with. I like how God uses the insignificant. God works through what we have and who we are. God doesn't care who you are this morning. God doesn't care about your past. That means nothing to God. You see, there's something that Jesus did. He, he died on the cross and shed his blood for all our sins. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I did in my life. No. And you know what? If you ask God to forgive you for your sins, God doesn't remember it either. He doesn't. The Bible says he's cast in the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is from the west. So God can use you this morning. He said, but I, I've fell so many times. So what? Righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again, the Word of God says. The little boy was in the right place at the right time. Are, are you available for God this morning? Watch this story, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. I always liked this story, and I was in Maine, and they have an accent in Maine. If you're watching from Maine this morning, I love you, but you have an accent. You do in Rhode Island, too. You do in Rhode Island. But it always amazed me how the guy was asking for alms, and God gave him legs. To ask alms to those who entered the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. It's like a panhandler, you know. But this guy's crippled, he can't walk. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Every once in a while, someone will leap in church. Doesn't really bother me. Because this guy did the same thing when he went in the temple. Why? Because of what God had done for him. I tell you, it's going to affect you when God touches your life. Peter and John couldn't give them any money, but they could heal the lame man by the power of God. Why? Because they had been in the right place with God. Little boy had just what God needed for over 5,000 people. Five loaves of bread and two small fish. Just what God needed. That's it. That's it. There used to be a singer by the name of Gary Paxton. I believe he's passed on now, but we used to sing this song in church. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to quote the words. Verse says, time after time, I went searching for peace in some void. I was trying to blame all my ills on this world I was in. Surface relationship used me till I was done in. All the while, someone was begging to free me from sin. And the Course says, he was there all the time. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. He was there all the time. In the midst of your trial, I want to tell you this morning, Jesus is there. In the midst of your darkest moment of life, Jesus is there. In your sickness, Jesus is there. In your loneliness, Jesus is there. In your sorrow, Jesus is there because Jesus is there all the time. Be available for God. Be there for Him. Because today, there is a miracle in this crowd. Lastly, this morning, you need to be willing to give everything. The boy was not only there when God needed him, but he was willing to give what he had. Well, that's a miracle in itself for a kid. I remember when Levi was real little, I was driving the bus in Canada one night for uh, our children's program that we had in the church up there. And so we went, and of course, uh, my wife wouldn't have done this, but I just do this, just keep them quiet. 
So I took him to the store and I said, get something. So he'd be, you know, settled down the bus. So we went and got this big bag of candy. So I said, sure. His mother would have never done that, but I just, you know, get a big bag of candy. And I, so he sat in the bus and I said, well, that'll entertain him while I'm picking all these older kids up. So here I go. And, and Levi was maybe about four, five, that age. So I was picking up kids that were like six, seven, eight years old on this bus. And so Levi's sitting there with a big bag of candy and children are all on this, getting on this bus. Finally, one of the kids in the back says, Levi, can I have a piece of candy? Nope. Just like that. Just, just like, nope. And I said, Levi, come here a minute. I said, give me that candy. Stop the bus. And I went and gave all the kids in the bus a piece of candy. He didn't want to give up any of his candy. Now he knows what that's like because he's got two daughters and, and they want whatever the other one has. It's, it's, it's like really a real issue in that home right now because those two girls want everything that the other one has. That's just the way kids are. So to me, that was a huge miracle that this kid was willing to say, yeah, sure, go ahead, take my lunch. Take my five loaves and two fi or five fish and two loaves. Take it. You see, all of us have been in the position to help someone, but we failed. All of us have been in the position to help someone to receive what they need in their life, but maybe we've been too busy, too selfish, too backward, too ashamed, too lazy. What stops us? You see, our flesh, and get this, for those of you that want to go deeper in God, I want you to go deeper in God, but be very careful. Our flesh wants the spectacular. The da -da -da -dum, you know? They want to shake, they want to, you know, they want to, whatever. Be careful of that. Your flesh likes that. Your flesh likes that. If you know the story in the Bible about Elijah, Levi talked about him this morning, but after that story, there was a time where he went and he was running from a woman by the name of Jezebel. And he didn't put his faith in God like he should at that time. But anyway, he ran away and hid in a cave. And he got himself in a cave. And he said, God, it's, it would be better that I die. And all of a sudden, there was a great earthquake. There was a great wind. And then there was another great fire came from heaven, lightning came from heaven. And each time, when the wind happened, boom, big wind, he's, oh, it must be God. It wasn't God. The Bible says God wasn't in the wind. Then came the lightning from heaven, the fire. That, that sounds spiritual. Can you say amen this morning? That's got to be God if it's fire. The Bible says God wasn't in the fire. And then the earthquake, things shook. Man, did the church ever shake tonight? You know, oh. but the Bible says that God wasn't in the earthquake either. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says there came a still, small voice. Don't allow your flesh to look so much for the spectacular and miss the voice of God. Because he comes in a still, small voice. That's how I've always had God speak to me. It's never been in a big way. It's always been in a time of prayer. Usually I've been all alone. And God spoke into my heart and into my life. And I said, thank you, Jesus, for the answer. Getting your miracle takes the, the willingness to give what you have. Yeah. Your life. Yeah. Can you give your life to God? What you have. You know what you have? You have the ability to encourage others. You have that ability. I have encouragers in this church. Pastor Leon is an encourager, my, and I'm so thankful for that. And uh, another one is Ralph Kudzma. If you listen to the way Ralph Kudzma describes me or says the type of preacher I am or pastor I am, you would think I out Billy Graham to Billy Graham. <laughs> but he's an encourager. What about your talent? Giving that to God. What about resources? Giving that to God. God simply looks for a willing heart. He doesn't like the big show. He just wants the willing heart. Mark chapter 12 is a wonderful story in the Bible. Verse 41, Jesus was watching what people put in the offering. That'd be pretty intimidating. Can you say amen? The Bible says in verse 41, sitting across from the offering box, he was observing how the crowd tossed money in for the collection. Many rich were making large contributions. One poor widow came up and put in two small coins. A measly two cents. Jesus calls his disciples over and said, 
The truth is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others put together. All the others gave what they'll never miss. She gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford. She gave her all. Everything she had. As the band starts to play for me this morning, God wants nothing but the best for you, and God wants you to have your miracle. You may be here and say, but pastor, I tried, and I just, it just feels like the more I tried, the less it seemed to happen. It just seems like heaven's become brass, and I've felt that way in my life before. Let me give you a scripture this morning. God said to Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 32 and 31, get this, it says that God left him to try him so that he might know all that was in his heart. What was in his heart? The great preacher, George Whitfield, years ago preached two services on Sunday up in New Hampshire in two different churches. And then he got in his horse and buggy and he made his way back to where he was staying in Newburyport, Massachusetts. He arrived in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he was staying at about midnight. And when he got there, there was a huge crowd of people that were there waiting for him. And they said, we're here. We traveled a long ways to hear you preach. He was 80 years old. He was tired. But he took a candle out. And he lit the candle. He set it on his porch. And he said, I'll tell you what. I'll preach to you until this candle goes out. And he preached the message to the throng of people that were there, gave an altar call, and people came forward and gave their life to Christ. He went up the stairs to where he was staying in his bedroom, and he took his lamp with him. And he laid his lamp down beside his bed, and he got down on his knees, as was his custom, to pray before he went to sleep. The next morning, They went up the stairs and they found him still kneeling by the bed. He had died in his sleep and went to be with God. On his tombstone it is written, George Whitfield, he preached until his candle went out. There's a miracle in the crowd this morning. Young person, you may be that miracle today. Give your life to Christ. I started, within the last year, writing things down that I would tell myself if I could see myself at 18 years of age again, if I could go back. One of the first things I put on that list, I would tell myself, you'll never be sorry you gave your life to Christ. Never. I'm 56 now, but if I could go back, I would tell Alan Pangburn at the age of 18, you'll never be sorry you gave your life to Christ. You say, well, pastor, I've sinned. I've failed God. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Let's get that straight. Let's not use that, my sins, any longer. Jesus said, what sin once you've given your life to Christ? You may be the miracle. You say, me? Me, pastor? Yes, you might be the miracle in the crowd this morning that God wants to use to do something great in the kingdom of God. Be there when God calls. Be available when God calls. Be willing to give when God calls. Because today, there is a miracle in the crowd. Would you all stand with us this morning? I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would. Respect and honor to God. I have to ask you this morning, because one day I will stand before God and give an account. I have to ask the question, are you ready to meet Jesus? Have you ever given your life to Christ and say, God, I want you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life? Because you might be here this morning, you're ripe and you feel the Holy Spirit calling upon you. And if I stand before God, God says, you know, if you'd have asked them to give their life to Christ, they'd have gave their life to Christ, but you failed that morning. I don't want that to happen to me. And this morning, I believe that the Holy Spirit is in this room drawing people to Him. 
You may have never even given your life to Christ yet, but you may be the miracle in the crowd. Could be you. God will forgive you for any sin because He loves you today. If that's you this morning, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you say, Pastor, today I want to give my life to Jesus. Just put your hand up so I can see who I'm praying for this morning. Amen. I thank you for all those hands. Hallelujah. Look at all those hands giving their life to Christ this morning. That's beautiful. You can put them down. My next question is this. Are you available for God this morning? Say, God, I, I've given you my life, but are you available for God? That God can take and use you. You may be the miracle in the crowd this morning. In fact, you are the miracle in the crowd. God's going to use you. God will use anyone that will say, God, here I am. I wonder how many here this morning say, Pastor, I want to make my life available to God and allow God to speak into my life and whatever God wants to do with my life. I say, God, here I am use me my life is not my own i give it to you if that's you this morning all over this congregation can you put your hand in the air i put two hands in the air this morning god here's my life take my life hallelujah as they sing this course i want every person that raised your hand to come and join us at this altar and we're going to pray a prayer this morning together if you didn't raise your hand but you know you should be here come this morning come as they sing everyone that raised your hand yes lord my life is not my Jesus. own to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My Bye. life is not my own yes, Lord. to you. I, belong. you. I give myself to you. I give myself. I give myself. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. My life is not my own. Today, Lord, I believe that you have spoken in the hearts of men and women, young and old. God, they are a miracle in this crowd this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak into their heart and into their life. Lead them by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let them be willing to say, Lord, here I am. I am yours. I'm available to you. God, and it will be worth it all on the other side. I say that about myself this morning once again, Lord. Take my life. Use it for your honor, your glory, in the kingdom of God. For my life is not my own. I have been bought with a price. And I say, Lord, take it once again. Forgive me, Lord, for the times that I have not been there for you. For you have always been there for me. Speaking to hearts and lives this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit. Say this prayer with me if you would. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Because you gave me your life. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for being selfish when you have given me so much. Today I lay my life before you. And I say, here I am. Use me for your honor and your glory. And I thank you for saving my life. And because you saved me, someday I'm going to meet you on the other side. But while I am here, I want to be the miracle in the crowd. I don't know where. I don't know when. I don't know how. You're going to use me, but I know you have a plan for my life. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Give the Lord a good hand this morning.